I want to change tack a little bit. Uh, I was very impressed by this particular review by Pedersen and Febrio. Uh, it really brings home to me after 25 years of researching and teaching in this area that we still know very little about the musculo system and its function. Uh, I've always concentrated on its contractile capabilities, but it has many, many more functions other than that. And this is a very interesting review paper here uh, published in Nature Review's Endocrinology and um, looking at muscles and exercise and even relating it to obesity, but really examining skeletal muscle as a secretory organ. It is a major organ within the body with both autocrine, in other words, it's secreting substances within its own cells, paracrine, so it's, it's secreting uh, substances, chemical messages from the muscle cells which are then moving to other uh, cells in the muscle. But it also has an endocrine function where those substances, those chemical messages and hormones are actually going out into the circulation and impacting all the other tissues in the body, muscle, fat, nerve, bone. Now the important factor here is that the mass of muscle and the training parameters will determine the secretory characteristics and their effects. So this is a diagram from that paper just demonstrating some of the interactions that occur. The authors are really uh, trying to explain to us the importance of muscle contraction and muscle size on the regulation of fat tissue in the body. But it also has a big effect on bone and we're looking at this very closely because in many of the athletes that we work with we have issues around bone density and chronic stress fractures in these athletes. We have to maintain muscle mass in the body, we have to activate it appropriately so it generates all of these interleukins, uh, uh, IGF, um, insulin-like factors. We have to understand this and then not only maintain but increase muscle mass so we have a bigger organ to actually drive all these other mechanisms. I want to turn my attention to testosterone and uh, what an important hormone it is and how important it is for the uh, support and maintenance of our athletes. So it's one of the most powerful anabolic hormones in the body. It influences muscle, yes, but it also has a very powerful effect on bone. That's why we've turned our attention to it to try and understand why uh, some of our athletes, particularly our Australian rules football players, are having such issues around bone density and stress fractures. But testosterone drives not only muscle growth but also bone growth. It also is impacts on the brain and peripheral nerves. It's a mediator of tissue repair, very powerful in terms of driving recovery. Now the gen genomic effects are really well uh, demonstrated and understood. The chronic release of uh, testosterone during heavy resistance training by large muscle mass exercises and high volume is very, very important to maintain this anabolic environment within our athletes. Now these are studies, just a series of studies showing the effects of intensity and volume on acute testosterone response. Now yes, look, there's some studies which show uh, a non-significant change, but by far the majority of studies show considerable increases in testosterone release acutely with particular types of training. A key point here is that not all types of resistance training cause good testosterone response. It's highly specific in terms of the protocol. And it's generally around heavy resistance, large muscle groups, multiple sets. Now testosterone is very, very important. It has a large effect on the body. Here's some examples of pure testosterone supplementation, no training. And we see protein synthesis up 27%, fat-free mass up 6.1 kilos, muscle mass in one study up 20%. Changes in muscle size here, changes in strength alone, 22 kilo increase in bench press just through testosterone supplementation. Now that is illegal of course with athletes, not so with patients, but it is illegal with athletes. What we have to do is achieve similar improvements, similar increases in testosterone in our athletes to generate these same effects. As I said, we've been quite interested in the uh, anabolic effects of testosterone on bone health in our athletes because of the high incidence we've had of um, uh, stress fractures and other uh, even catastrophic fractures. We examine these athletes uh, using, uh, this particular technique is used in peripheral quantitative computer tomography or PQCT. We also use DEXA. And what we're seeing is that many of our, uh, our athletes have 
similar bone densities to normal sedentary males aged match. And that's a problem given the training loads that they're undergoing. It's quite uh, difficult to understand given the amount of exercise that they're doing. We would expect them to have much higher bone densities. But many of these athletes are quite catabolic. They have very high uh, endurance training programs which are really suppressing testosterone. They're also not having the heavy resistance training uh, sessions in a regular basis each week to maintain testosterone and they're getting in quite a catabolic state. For us, it's really impacting on, on bone and that's our current issue we're dealing with. So uh, low testosterone and elevated cortisol we're seeing causes tissue quality and quantity changes and reduced failure threshold. So this has a significant impact for injury prevalence, how resilient the athlete is because testosterone not only affects bone but also connective tissue including tendon and ligament. It's also important for recovery. Look, we know from uh, the old research around the use of anabolic steroids. The, the, the ability of these athletes to recover is just phenomenal. I mean, uh, Georgie had remembered some of the training protocols that we've seen that they, we, they used with these athletes and you couldn't do it today. I mean, you, you kill the athlete. But because they had a very, very anabolic environment, um, which was exogenous, they were able to respond, adapt and recover. We have to try and simulate as far as possible legally through training that high anabolic environment. Now, there are also non-genomic non factors that are very, very important, which respond to testosterone as well. This is a very nice paper written from, from Michael McGuigan's group here. Uh, evidence for non-genomic action of testosterone in skeletal muscle, which also uh, is a mechanism by which it improves performance. This is uh, particular so for the female athlete. And I'll read it because it's so nicely written here. Direct non-genomic activation of calcium-mediated events in skeletal muscle cells which may modulate significant physiological responses such as acute modulation of force in individual fibres and acute prevention or protection against calcium-mediated fatigue. Testosterone is acting directly on the muscle cells to increase their contractility and to reduce their fatigability. There are also a very wide range of psychological effects, including improved aggression, confidence, and reduced anxiety and depression. Cognitive function and memory are, are improved. We have a large number of studies showing that, that testosterone patches greatly reduce the progression of Alzheimer's disease. Particularly in female athletes, it's effective because female athletes have uh, lower levels of circulating testosterone, so when you surge it up, it really produces some fantastic improvements. It has much higher effect than a male athlete which already has a reasonable level of testosterone um, circulating. I'm going to draw an example from David Hamilton who used to be with um, uh, Great Britain Hockey. He's now moved across the States to work with uh, uh, US Hockey. An example from field hockey. I'll, I'll come back to that example at the moment, uh, in a moment when I just explain this next slide. Um, but David has been having a look at the concept of priming uh, which is nothing new, but he's coming at it from a slightly different angle, trying on the day of competition to actually manipulate testosterone in his female athletes. Uh, it's a combination of rest, motivation and training. If you get your athletes fired up through a motivational talk, their testosterone increases. That's got to be of benefit if you then combine it with certain types of uh, very low volume, high intensity training such as heavy uh, back squats or deadlifts, you again can produce an acute spike in testosterone on the day of competition. Now this increases neuromuscular, cognitive, motor and psychological capabilities. And so in the women they became more aggressive, more confident, reduced anxiety because testosterone suppresses anxiety in the brain, but also their whole motor system is being ramped up or turbocharged. Now, interestingly, David uses a particular test, which is a drop test, or depth jumps as sometimes called, where the athlete drops down onto a force plate or contact mat, and then they calculate a whole parameters, but in particular, the reactive strength index. And this afternoon in my workshop, we'll go into depth in the calculation and measurement of this, but this has been proven to be quite an effective way to actually monitor, if you like, the, um, the neural readiness of the athlete. And Dave Hamilton has shown with very, very high level uh, athletes in field hockey that through certain types of training and other interventions, they can manipulate the reactive strength index. And also he showed strong correlations between that and salivary testosterone measures 
It seems to be an index, index of neuromuscular status. Now, uh, this slide is unashamedly stolen straight from David, but I have acknowledged him down the bottom here. Um, so please, if you get the opportunity, have a look at some of his work. I think it's really making a difference in terms of the management of our athletes. So this is the priming study he conducted. This is with elite um, Great Britain hockey players, uh, no control group. Um, but what he's done is tried different things over time here. He's used this pre-priming, uh, where you look at uh, here, 10 a.m., they're in the gym, uh, doing their, uh, their heavy lifting, very low volume, and he's measuring depth jump and the reactive strength index, the ratio between flight time and contact time. So he measures it here. They then do their gym intervention. They do six to seven hours rest, and then immediately pre-game, he is again testing reactive strength index, and then at 6 p.m. they're playing their uh, competition. So this is a normal game here versus Germany. Um, if you have a look here, this is all the individual data. We see a, a variation in response, absolutely, but the mean change is no difference between this point in time and later in the day. But he then had a look at two games where he pre-primed them, and we have a look, this game here versus South Africa, only got data on five players here, but a significant improvement, increase in reactive strength index. Uh, also here against Ireland, uh, some 14 players here, and we see that uh, also, again, the mean increase is quite considerable. So it's probably a combination of neural activation, but also he, he saw changes in testosterone, which are probably also driving this. So that's exciting. I want to turn my attention now to strength maintenance in season. I still see a large number of teams, both professional and at um, national and national level, who uh, remove all heavy strength training in season for fear of injury or that it's going to fatigue the athlete or it's going to impact their performance in competition. So I've got a couple of papers to present to you. The first one is um, from the Norway group, Norwegian School of Sports Sciences here, uh, led by Truls Rastad. And what they did was they had a look at the effect of training uh, pre-season. This is their pre-season strength here, and they're moving to mid-season. They trained two times per week in the pre-season. Then they divided the groups up. These are in fairly good uh, high-level athletes. And uh, one lot of athletes tr continued heavy resistance training once per week. The other group trained only once per fortnight. And what we saw was really no change in terms of one repetition maximum in this group, but a significant reduction here in the group that only trained uh, every second week. So their strength can be maintained in season if they do enough sessions. If you have a look at their 40 metre sprint time though, probably a more relevant, I guess, test in terms of these athletes, uh, we see also that they're able to maintain their sprint time here between pre and mid-season. However, the group that only trained every fortnight, they had an increase in time, in other words, a reduction in speed, which was significant. So it appears then from this that once a fortnight is not sufficient to maintain strength and therefore uh, power quality. This is uh, relatively old data from K.O. Hackenden back in 1988, but it's interesting because he's presented so much of this work, but 20, 30 years on, we still, we haven't changed the, the training, we haven't taken notice of this very, very important work. What, what this is for elite uh, basketball players here, and this is uh, at the start of the season and after the season. This is their maximal strength, we see here, um, and this is their uh, in, uh, isometric leg extension, this is their rate of force development. And the take home point of uh, this from this particular research is that over the course of the season, uh, even though they're training once a week in heavy resistance training, we see a non-significant change in maximal strength, but a significant reduction in the ability to increase force rapidly. So their RFD is decreasing significantly over the season. Also from K.O. Hackenden's group here, this time in elite female volleyball players. What they, this is the preparatory season here. They then did 10 weeks of the first competitive season, a three-week um, uh, break here where they continued to train, of course, and then the incompetitive, uh, another uh, second uh, competitive season of 11 weeks. And uh, you can see the training here. This is a high volume of maximal strength training here. They went back to it here in this uh, mid-period, but they continued power training throughout the whole time period here. What's interesting though is if we have a look at their 
um, their squats jump here. We see that there's a, it's maintained fairly well while they're doing heavy resistance training. As soon as they stop heavy resistance training, the squat jump declines, even though they're doing power training. And we see here that in terms of their maximal strength, the same thing. It's increasing across here, but then as soon as they stop strength training, as expected, their strength declines. Even though they're doing power training, they cannot maintain their high-velocity, powerful movements if their strength is declining. You need strength as the underlying quality to support power. So the key points at this stage. We have to achieve and maintain hypertrophy in our athletes. Maximal strength is necessary precursor to maximal power. Strength training induces changes in the neuromuscular and endocrine systems way beyond purely force production. We have to consider this. Strength training is essential at all phases for all athletes. There is no athlete that should be stepping away from strength and power training at any time. Certainly, the programming variables will shift quite markedly in terms of volume and intensity and other aspects. In-season maximal strength training is critical every seven to 10 days as a minimum. Once every two weeks is insufficient. I uh, just want to change uh, another tact here, another avenue which I think is underdone in terms of our elite athlete management, and that is performance diagnosis. Uh, time and time again, I go and I see uh, very high level teams with really smart people uh, managing them, and they're doing the same thing with all athletes. All athletes are getting the same program. Um, I won't name any teams or any names, but um, I observed, looked at their, their training programs recently, and they had a consultancy team come in from the US. Won't name them either. But uh, the rowers were doing the same strength training program as the gymnasts. The gymnasts were doing power cleans and push presses. The, the, the rowers were doing a whole range of Olympic lifts. Uh, there was no adaptation to the actual performance qualities which were required by the specific sport. Now, this is very wasteful of the athlete's time. If you throw everything at the athlete, all right, some things will stick, some things won't. But the biggest factor is that you're impacting them with too many changing demands, some of which are simply not important to their particular sport. So performance diagnosis is determining the key cardiorespiratory and neuromuscular components which characterise that performance, discriminating and evaluating these components to inform program design, and this is termed performance diagnosis. And it's based on the fact that certain measures represent specific or independent qualities of performance. Now this comes back to one of the basic principles of exercise physiology, that of diminishing returns. We have a window of adaptation for any of our athletes in any of their qualities. It has a genetic limit to it. But by determining those components in which the athlete is most weak, if we target those components, we'll have the greatest improvement in training efficiency and effectiveness. Importantly, we must avoid emphasising a component which is unimportant or near the genetic limit of that component. So if it's already highly developed, there's no point putting a huge amount of training emphasis into it. You just need to maintain. And this is demonstrated here. I've used a five-component model, which many of you will have seen me present previously. This is for team sports de development, such as field hockey or soccer. We see strength and power is important, sprint speed, change of direction, repeat sprint ability, aerobic capacity. And each of these components can be trained and developed and assessed independently. But also we can delve down into each individual component such as strength and power and then look at the components or qualities which contribute to this performance outcome. And we see that for, strength and for maximal strength, we see strength at slow velocities, maximum rate of force development is important, stress shortening cycle or reactive strength, strength at fast velocities, and also the ability to coordinate in terms of the muscles and the actual skill itself. We can develop each of these. We can assess them, target them specifically, and develop each independently as well. But we can also dig down further into the underlying qualities behind strength at slow velocities or maximal strength. Once again, I've used the five component model here, and we see that musculotendinous stiffness is a big factor which can be manipulated through training. Motor unit recruitment and rate coding, uh, the neural factors that control how much force we can exert, of course, muscle architecture in terms of pronation angle, but also muscle cross-sectional area. All of these components can be manipulated individually and will contribute to improvements in the overall uh, parent quality. We need to assess these components 
using well-validated techniques, understanding the qualities that are critically important for the target sport that we're, we're aiming at, uh, and then to change our training programs and tailor them specific to the athlete. So A, we don't overtrain them, B, we don't train them inefficiently by training things which aren't important, or C, training components which are already highly developed and can't be improved any further. Look, I thank you very much for your time uh, this morning. I appreciate it very much, your attention. And I'd just like to acknowledge all of the fantastic researchers that I've had the uh, opportunity to work with over the last quarter of a century. Thank you very much.